In the bustling hallway of his college, Brian, a 22-year-old senior, stumbled upon a beacon of hope pinned to the bulletin board. A flyer from the psychology department, slightly askew but undeniably eye-catching, advertised a study on regression. It promised $100 a day plus free meals for five days during the winter break. The scant details provided did little to deter him. Seeing a chance to alleviate his financial woes, Brian eagerly signed up, his eyes sparkling with a mixture of desperation and curiosity. Days later, amidst the camaraderie and raucous excitement of a football game with friends, his phone erupted with a ring that cut through the noise. The call was an acceptance into the study, with clear instructions to bring only essentials, medication, and eyeglasses being the exceptions. Excitement and curiosity surged through Brian as he prepared for the first day, his heart beating in anticipation of the unknown. The study was located in a remote part of campus in room 311, a nondescript door that opened into a world of intrigue. Upon entering, Brian was greeted by Mrs. Alexander, the study's coordinator. Her warm demeanor stood in stark contrast to the clinical setting, a room filled with about 10 other young men, each selected for their varied backgrounds and psychological profiles. Their faces, a mosaic of life stories, looked back at him with the same mix of nervousness and intrigue. Mrs. Alexander shared that they were carefully chosen from 50 applicants. The study, she explained, would be tailored to each participant through individual interviews. Brian, assigned number eight, watched his peers enter the interview room one by one, their steps echoing with a mixture of trepidation and determination. When his turn came, Mrs. Alexander led him to a smaller room, a sanctuary of privacy within the clinical expanse. She stressed the importance of honesty for the study's success, her voice a soothing balm in the sterile atmosphere. I'm going to ask you a series of questions, she said, her gaze kind yet piercing. Can you please answer to the best of your ability and be as honest and transparent as possible? Yes, of course, Brian replied, his voice betraying a hint of nervousness. Okay, first question. At what age were you completely dry during the day and night? She inquired, her tone gentle yet direct. Brian felt a blush creep up his cheeks, a vivid splash of red against his pale skin. I was potty trained at four, but I wasn't completely dry at night until, um, 12. No, actually around 12, and there were occasional accidents even after that, he confessed, his words tumbling out in a rush. Are you sure about that? Mrs. Alexander asked gently, her expression one of understanding and patience. Brian nodded, unable to meet her gaze, the floor suddenly fascinating. So, you were completely dry after 12? She pressed, her voice soft yet insistent. Well, there were occasional accidents, Brian admitted, his voice trailing off into the silence of the room. It's okay, Brian. Can you tell me when the last time you had a nighttime accident was? Mrs. Alexander asked, her tone reassuring, a lighthouse guiding him through a storm of embarrassment. Brian squirmed in his seat, the fabric of the chair suddenly itchy against his skin. At 18, he murmured, the words barely escaping his lips. Was there any stress that day, or anything unusual? She probed, her curiosity cloaked in professional concern. I had a big test the next morning, but I aced it. There was no real reason to be nervous, Brian explained, his voice gaining a semblance of strength. That's perfectly okay. It's more common than you might think. And yes, at 18, you were indeed a man. It seems you'll be a good fit for this study. Are you ready for the next stage? Mrs. Alexander concluded, a note of encouragement weaving through her words. Brian, feeling a weight lifted off his shoulders, nodded, his spirit buoyed by her acceptance. Do you have any pets or anyone that would need your attention during the study period? She asked, her gaze sweeping over him, taking in every detail. No, I don't. Brian responded, his mind racing with the possibilities that lay ahead. Then please inform your family that you'll be unavailable for about a week, she instructed, her voice a mix of firmness and warmth. Following her advice, Brian called his mother to explain his upcoming unavailability. Hey mom, 
I'm going to be part of a study and can't call for a week, he said, before ending the call, a lump forming in his throat at the thought of the distance, both physical and emotional, that would separate them. With a mix of nerves and anticipation, Brian was ready to embark on this unexpected journey. The opportunity promised not only financial relief, but also a dive into the unknown, a prospect that now seemed more exhilarating than daunting. Mrs. Alexander had just mentioned she had an advanced experiment in mind for Brian, and she needed him to accompany her home. This unexpected twist sent a ripple of confusion through Brian's thoughts. Why do you want me to go home with you? Brian asked, his brows knitting together in a mixture of curiosity and apprehension. I can't disclose the details now. Do you want the money? You'll need to come with me, Mrs. Alexander responded, her tone laced with an enigmatic assurance that piqued Brian's intrigue even further. Torn between his need for financial relief and the sudden mysterious turn the study had taken, Brian hesitated. The offer was unconventional, to say the least, but his financial situation left him with little room for choice. With a reluctant nod, he agreed, following Mrs. Alexander to the parking lot where her SUV awaited. As he was about to climb into the passenger seat, Mrs. Alexander halted him. No, you have to sit in the back, she instructed, her voice carrying an unexpected note of firmness. Confused, Brian peered into the back seat and his eyes widened in disbelief. There, occupying the space, was a giant car seat, utterly incongruous with his expectations. What the hell? He blurted out, unable to hide his astonishment. It isn't what it looks like, but I need you to sit in it. Can you do that? Mrs. Alexander replied, her tone attempting to smooth over the bizarre request with a veneer of normalcy. Well, I guess so, Brian said after a moment his voice tinged with skepticism that mirrored his internal turmoil. He settled into the car seat, an adult man confined in a space designed for a child, his situation straddling the line between the absurd and the surreal. Just let me strap you in and relax, Mrs. Alexander instructed as she secured the straps around him, her actions methodical, betraying no hint of the peculiarity of the situation. Okay. Brian replied, his voice a mix of resignation and curiosity. The drive to Mrs. Alexander's house took about 20 minutes, each minute stretching out as Brian's mind raced with questions and speculations about the nature of the experiment he had unwittingly become a part of. Upon arriving at a modest house in a quiet suburb just off campus, Mrs. Alexander turned to Brian with a seriousness that had been absent during the drive. You know... I'm a psychologist and also a licensed doctor. If I give you some medication, will you take it? She asked, her gaze piercing through the dimming light of the day. Brian looked up, the gravity of the situation finally settling in. I don't know, he responded, his voice laced with hesitation. Well, you did sign up for this experiment, and if you want the money, I suggest you do as I say. There's nothing that will harm you. It's for your own good, Mrs. Alexander explained, her tone reassuring yet firm, leaving little room for argument. Looking down, Brian considered his options. The promise of financial relief was enticing, but the unfolding reality of the experiment began to cast a shadow of doubt over his initial eagerness. Well, I guess I can if you say it won't hurt me or anything. He finally said, his decision born from a complex mix of need, trust, and the sheer surrealness of the situation. Mrs. Alexander smiled, a gesture meant to comfort, and gently pinched his cheek. No, honey, I'm only here to help, she reassured him, her voice soft yet carrying an undertone of authority that left Brian with more questions than answers. As Brian stepped into Mrs. Alexander's home, he couldn't shake the feeling of having crossed a threshold into the unknown, his heart heavy with anticipation and apprehension about what the next week would hold. They eventually got to her home. It was in the city, just outside the college campus, in a nice, quiet neighborhood. They walked into the house, a pink two-story building that looked like any ordinary home. Then Mrs. Alexander said, I need you to do something before I give you the medication. 
Brian replied, yes, what is it? She explained, the medication is sensitive. It's going to help you relax. But for some folks, they have a bit of trouble controlling their pee and poop, she said in a childish, infantilizing manner. Brian said, okay. Mrs. Alexander had a weird request for him. I need you to wear a diaper, she stated. Brian was taken aback. What? At home? You have to wear it around the house and you can't wear any pants. I need to see when you have an accident. It's for your own good, she explained. Brian was hesitant. I don't know. Don't you want the money? And don't worry about it. This isn't a big deal, Mrs. Alexander reassured him. Brian, driven by his need, finally agreed. Fine, but nobody knows about this, right? Mrs. Alexander mimed, zipping up her lips and locking them. Then, Brian asked, so what now? She grabbed him by the hand and led him to the bathroom, which looked ordinary but had a giant table in the middle. Do you want me to lay on that? He asked. Yes, honey, how did you know? She replied. Brian lay down, and Mrs. Alexander proceeded to put on the diaper. Despite the oddity of the situation, Brian found himself enjoying the experience. After the deed was done, he looked in the mirror, touched the diaper, and thought to himself that this wasn't going to be so bad, especially considering he was being paid for it by a beautiful woman. How lucky was he? Soon, Mrs. Alexander called him downstairs for some food. Feeling a bit awkward walking around in just his diaper and a t-shirt, Brian reminded himself that she had probably conducted this experiment many times before. She then said she needed to give him some more medication along with a snack. Brian chose a turkey sandwich, and she served it with grape juice in a sippy cup to avoid spills on the carpet. After taking his medication and drinking the grape juice, Brian felt tired and slightly sedated. Mrs. Alexander noticed his tiredness and suggested he lay down. She took him to a bedroom decorated in a space theme, which used to belong to her son. Brian lay down, feeling groggy, and eventually fell asleep. When he woke up, he realized he had had an accident, but remembered there was no need to panic. Mrs. Alexander had prepared him for this situation by putting him in the diaper. End of chapter one.